So again, um, a very warm welcome to everyone um, uh, to our discussion event today, Responsible Mining and the Right to Say No. My name is Tilman Massa from the Association of Ethical Shareholders Germany, and we host this event together with Bread for the World. Um, it's part of the Alternative Raw Materials Week, a series of events uh, right now focusing on social and environmental impacts of raw material supply chains and necessary changes to the official raw material strategy of the German government. And I just would like to give you a, a quick overview why our topic is so important right now. And um, that's basically given to the necessary change towards a sustainable economy free of fossil fuels. The mining industry, the mining sector in general, is under pressure to show that sourcing of materials, and especially those materials called transition minerals like lithium, can be done in a socially and environmentally responsible way. At least there is an urgent need to stop environmental and human rights violations the mining sector sadly has become known for. Um, but on the other hand, it's not only mining companies. Um, given pressure from um, more due diligence legislation, but also pressure from social movements, it's all the companies involved in the supply and value chains, and they no, no longer can deny their responsibility. So it is time that social and environmental standards no longer only exist on paper, but lead to real improvements for mining affected communities. But as you can imagine, the challenges do not stop there. Um, there is an unequal structure of raw material supply chains based in colonial foundations. And still today, there's a very unjust distribution of risks and wealth in favor of rich countries. And given the multiple crises of climate change and destruction of biodiversity, it becomes clearer every day that raw materials have to stay in the ground. So traditional patterns and strategies of growth and development seem to be part of the problem of the solution anymore. So um, that puts the mining industry, mining sites, and, and especially mining affected communities once more at the very center of struggles to overcome uh, unsustainable ways of production. And so giving voice to those affected by mining is crucial to understand and approach existing conflicts. Um, today, we want uh, not to focus on a single case as it's mostly done, but rather take a step back. And we want to highlight and discuss two concepts that have been growing some momentum ultimately. And that is what our very title is, responsible mining on the one hand and the right to say no on the other. And therefore, I'm very excited to present to you our two speakers. Um, once there is Georgian Kenya Jotani, the Consent and Right to Say No coordinator from Women African Alliance, and Amy Boulanger, the executive director of the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance. And what we will do today is both will shortly present their work to tackle various aspects regarding mining and to, to solve uh, existing mining problems. And after that, we will have enough time to for your questions and comments. Um, and again, um, as um, stated, the idea is to close the event in around one hour. Um, as I do not need to remind you that it's a Saturday, but even more, I'm, I'm very happy that you all joined us today. So um, yeah, Georgian, um, the floor is yours to present your work um, you do at Women and, and what you do on the right to say no. Thank you very much, uh, Tilman, and uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to this uh, very important uh, event. Yeah, it's a pleasure basically being with you and sharing our work uh, with you. You've raised a very important issues, which has been uh, one of the key uh, priorities of uh, women. And um, without further ado, I will just proceed with my presentation and allow uh, others to raise some questions. So I'm starting very quickly by saying a little bit ab about WUMIN, which is an African Gender and Extractive Alliance formed in 2013 in South Africa. 
So what we are doing, basically, we are working with women to make sure that they have secure access to resources for life and livelihood and can themselves exercise full control over their bodies and development choices. So women is working to deepen resistance to specific destructive and extractive project based on the right to say no. So in so doing, we are working to advance uh, national movement campaigns on uh, the issue of consent and the right to say no of the affected communities. What we are calling affected communities are those who have been living or suffering the impact of mining in their communities and where they have never been consulted. consulted. So we are also working with women so that they can assert their development alternatives because today what it is said, you know, what we they are telling us is this one size fits all type of development. Is it really what women want in their community? So they are bringing their alternatives. So when they are saying no to mining, they have what they want. They have their project, their plan for their development. And we are also working to make sure that women assert their leadership. It's not women who is actually speaking on behalf of women, but rather those women speaking on their behalf. So we have uh, four areas of work, but the consent and the right to say no is um, the area of work which is basically working on the right to say no. And uh, die Frauen und alle das Recht haben nein zu sagen. Und jetzt gehe ich zu den. This is important to us because we know that. Um, this development, uh, the dominant approach of development, basically, which is the last scale exploitation of resources, is the source of this growing climate crisis. You know, depriving people from their livelihoods and also polluting earth, you know, the air and causing a lot of health problems. So this is really a very much, uh, this is uh, basically a big issue for us. The second thing is because the mining or this corporate mining are violating the human's rights. Not only the human rights, but also it is a challenge to the nature. We know what is happening around now with drugs, you know, and also the issues around the climate change. And equally, when uh, Tillman, you were speaking, we are also seeing that the state law and also other mechanism to protect the people in our countries and even the international soft law or international hard laws are not protecting the community. We even know of the FPIC, the free prayer and informed consent, which was supposed to protect the community, at least giving them the opportunity to say no or yes to a mining company who is coming to the country, but you know, that is not many companies are distorting the process, are not using that process. Even in our countries, the constitution also is very clear. It's a prime law, but it has never protected the communities in many instances. So now, what where is the right to say no basically is coming from? And what is the right to say no? As I said, when we started working as women, it was clear that um, communities at the in the rural area, basically, not only the indigenous communities, but the communities where mining is coming from, were trying to assert their rights. But it wasn't possible for them to assert their right because they couldn't know or they were not aware of all the laws even at the international level or at the national level protecting them. We thought that it would be very important to bring all this campaign, the campaigns and the communities struggling across the continent over many decades to come together in a struggle, 
we are calling right to say no to this large development project. So this uh, right to say no is equally a multi-organization um, project or let's say campaign, asserting the right of women, you know, claiming their right and their sovereignty and also fighting to have or struggling to get the consent right where they are. So I was happy to see Andy online Women is not working alone in this uh, process. Uh, this started with uh, in uh, Southern Africa in Johannesburg when the thematic social forum on mining and extractive economies took place. And we have you know, many campaigns coming from Europe, from Latin America, from uh, Africa and from Asia with the same slogan of the right to say no, coming together to assert their right. So now, when we are speaking about right to say no, what are our core demands? What are we asking? And now, uh, why are we coming together? First, we are saying the right to say no is a political call to action because in no laws we will see like explicitly uh, that uh, the law is saying you community have right to say no. Rather, there are provisions bringing communities to say no. For instance, as it is said that they need, you know, it's like community have to give their consent or to withhold their consent. So the right to say no basically is funded, you know, very centrally on this to contest the dominant power. And we know that when we are speaking about extractive, we are speaking about power of international uh, organization, sorry, a transnational corporation coming together and having their support, which are most of the time our national government to extract without taking care of the environment, of the environment and also the livelihood and interests of people. So this is a political call, you know, we are calling and we are coming and saying we have consent because we cannot just sit and see things changing without giving any consent or even like saying what you are planning to do in our community is not right. Reading our constitution, reading some of the tests, we have right to say no. And this political call can't be done alone or a single organization cannot do it alone. So we need many organizations coming together you know, to have that big political force to say no to, to mining. Then we are also saying that the right to say no is a trick to unify struggle. So when we are speaking about extractivism, extractivism, you know, is this big mining is like, um, we are not only speaking about extracting, you know, like gold or diamonds. We are seeing, you know, extraction or livelihood of population, which is threatened by, you know, this big agricultural project, fisheries, you know, the big dams, the highways. So all these- um, Allerdings auch in Zuge der- Coming together under the right to say no, struggling together. Those who are this, in this growing desperation, saying no to this development and also assert, their self-determination. The other core political demand, we are saying the right to say no is the call by community for their development sovereignty. The right to say no, basically they will, we will be asked, why are you saying no? Do you have you know, an alternative? Yes. In many countries, those communities at the grassroots level, they have their alternatives. And is that alternative that we want basically the community to bring in, not a sort of development which is imposed from outside, but the development which is coming from the community by the community and which is made from their own decision making process. So that is really very important. Then what we are also saying is that the right to say no is a tool for mobilization. How do we mobilize against you know, power, against state rapture? We really need basically to bring those who, as I said, 
who want to defend their livelihood, those who are marginalized, those who are challenging, you know, and resisting commodification, we want to bring them together and to demonstrate, you know, and work together to make sure that their right is taken into consideration. The very good, important issue I want to raise here is that the right to say no is against the marginalization of women. We know that when mining is coming into the community, those who are very much excluded, given the patriarchal patterns and also the control of land are women. And we know how women are working hard to take care of the family. So they are suffering, you know, of this patriarchal division of labor, that patriarchal, you know, um, uh, system, which is like taking over the power of women. And in this process, we are saying women have right. And if they are sitting to discuss about development or future, the development of their context of they really need basically to make sure that the women are at the forefront uh, of this campaign. What we are also saying is that I've spoken about this already. Uh, what I want to add basically, as I said at the beginning, that we are drawing, when we are talking about the right to say no, we are drawing on our local, our national, our regional, and also our international tools and instruments. I've spoken about the FPIC, the Free Prime and Informed Consent, which is a tool we can use. And then at the sub-regional and regional levels, we also have some tools we are also using. For instance, I'm based in Africa, and then uh, in West Africa, speaking about ECOWAS, the Economic Commission of um, uh, West African uh, State, we have the mining directive. And the mining directive basically is giving to the, is, is clearly stated in that uh, mining directive that the communities need to be consulted before any project is started in their local uh, context. And when we are also speaking about the African Union, it is clearly stated, you know, with uh, the Pan-African Parliament that the, the communities need to be informed, included, and also they need to give consent to any project. And the consent is not about consultation, coming and asking, do you want this? But, you know, a deep form of consultation, which will lead to consent, where they can withhold or they can give their, their, you know, their yes. So basically the right to say no is allowing us to challenge the dominant thinking, as I said, to make sure that decision is taken by communities and only for their own benefit and that the information is shared. The right to say no basically is also giving us opportunity to make sure that human rights the, of, of people is taken into account and also to make sure that the negative impact of mining in the community will stop. And that the community, if they are saying yes, in case they are saying yes to mining, they need to know what they are gaining and the process should continue. So we want, uh, I want to, 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 to finish my presentation uh, and allow you to basically ask more questions. We want basically to connect community struggle and that is what we have been doing at the national level, at the regional level, international level, bringing those struggles together, bringing the indigenous communities together to speak about their rights and to resist the mining because Elsewhere, everywhere we have been working, communities are saying no to mining. Thank you very much, Tilman. This is where I will stop with my presentation. Yeah, thank you very much, Georgian. Um, it was a very helpful and quick presentation why it's not about only negativity to say no, but also um, to be able to say yes to alternatives. Mm. Are there any comprehensive questions from our audience? Um, if so, please uh, go ahead. 
you can also use, as I wrote uh, the chat here, if you also later on would like to share your questions or comments with us, I will register all of it. And um, if that's not the case, well, I will hand over to Amy from the Initiative of Responsible Mining Assurance, because um, as Georgian just um, rightly stated, there is the um, some international mechanisms like the FPIC procedures, the free uh, or the right to do to free and prior and informed consent. But we, but we've seen in the past that mining companies often well thought about well we we have to inform mining affected communities about our projects, but cared less about the consent. And that is also why there was such a need to rightly stay uh, and say, well, there is a right to say no. At least um, it's the case for indigenous communities. Um, but the involvement and engagement with mining affected communities is, is crucial for any mining company today, at least if they want to present the, themselves as sustainable. And this is where you come in uh, with Irma. And yeah, I. I I'd like to ask you um, to, to give us a short overview about your work, Amy. Well, thank you for having me, Tillman, and it's a great honor to speak alongside with Georgine as well um, and the work that they're doing there. And um, so again, I'm Amy Boulanger with the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance, or IRMA. Um, I'm gonna say a few things before I say something about Irma, which I know or repeat some of what Tillman has already said and some of what Georgina has already said, but it's so important to say that I can't, um, I can't, uh, it's, you can't skip over it because wherever mining starts in the world today, it, it starts uh, in the context that it has operated for, for more than a century of industrial scale mining. And that's in a place where um, there is deeply broken trust between communities where mining happens uh, and the NGOs and labor unions who have advocated for the people who have been most impacted and the mining companies doing the work. There's this deeply broken trust between those communities and civil society and labor unions and the, the companies. And, and in many cases, as Georgine said, many of these communities were promised the benefits of mining, uh, financial prosperity, or jobs, or that the impacts that would come with mining would be cleaned up and the land would be restored to healthy uses after mining was done. And in many cases, those communities did not receive the benefits that were promised. Instead, they had been left with pollution, uh, very short-term jobs. This was not multi-generations of jobs, uh, a loss of clean drinking water. Um, Last time, for so for the land is for so all is verschmutzt, is the Gesundheit der Menschen is ruiniert. And viele dieser und, Schäden uh, werden nicht nur Jahrzehnte anhalten, sondern ja. Just as Georgine said, many of the communities where mining has happened have said they don't want any more of it. Um, and that's true whether you go to indigenous communities in the United States, where I live, if you go to indigenous communities in Nevada who are looking at new mining, or in Central Africa, or in Southeast Asia, you have many who've had mining who say we don't want more. And then you've got communities where there's new mining coming in who fear that if they allow that to come in, it won't be development, but it will be the same harm that have been done to others. Um, and so even as we face uh, that deep resistance, um, we have these deep complications in the world that we live today. Um, so, uh, I put those in three main buckets, but one is that we have some communities already living with mining right now. We're not talking just about something new. There's communities living with mines that are there, um, and they deeply need information about what's happening at the mine site. Is there water contamination? Are workers safe? Have the security forces at the gate been properly trained to avoid conflicts? Um, is cultural heritage being protected or not? Uh, do the people who live close around it, are they can we hear them so we know what they know about, uh, you know, after a big rain, that creek over there runs orange, or uh, we can see a conflict brewing here. Um, we can't ignore that this mining is already happening. So even as some communities need to be supported to say no, or even no more, we need to know what's happening with the mines that are there. We also need to know this because industrialized societies around the world continue to use materials from mines every day. 
Um, it's in our buildings, it's in our cars, our phones, our computers. So even those of us who are working for change are complicit in industrialized society. We are using these materials and this um, responsibility to create uh, support for change needs to be carried throughout a whole supply chain. Yes, the mining company, but those of us who are using these materials at the end, how do we push pressure and value for greater environmental and social responsibility? Um, there, if there is an awareness in the world of that in our food, there's more talk about how is food created or where does our power come from or where does our water come from, but very few people understand where the materials in their phone or their car or their buildings are coming from. And this is all the more important because as we talk about energy transition, there is talk about a whole new uh, uh, percentage of mining, a whole new set of materials. We have this very challenging conflict that we want renewable energy and to reduce the harm of climate change. But the materials needed to build solar. Wenn ich das in Klimakrise stattfindet, wo kommen die Batterien her? Was brauchen wir? We're doing harm in a world that's already experiencing the stress of climate change. Um, so it is a difficult moment to say we just won't have any mining unless we're going to figure out how do we do energy transition. Um, and in these basic materials industrialized society are using. There's incredibly important work, including by some who are on this call to look more at circular economy, to look at recycling, materials retrieval. Are we looking at mass transit? Are we looking at addressing inefficiency or waste or how disposable most products are? Um, and we need to level the playing field for these things. There's many subsidies for new extraction that aren't being given to recycling and materials retrieval. And so we need policy attention on these things. Um, otherwise, we're just going to hear, we need this endless amount of new materials, which doesn't exist. But even as we work on circular economy, things like lithium or cobalt, which go into the batteries to store renewable energy, um, there hasn't even been enough mined yet to get out and recycle the material. So how do we deal with this tension? Um, so, what IRMA hosts is a standard, which has been developed over 10 years to describe what would be best practices in responsible mining. It took more than 10 years to even come up with something like this because there is such conflict um, between the stakeholder sectors who would define such a standard. Um, what they have crafted is first the table which governs that standard, IRMA is equally governed by uh, civil society, including NGOs um, and labor unions and mining affected communities working alongside private sector companies like mining companies or finance or car makers, jewelers, those who make things there and trying to spend more than 15 years struggling through um, asking many of you and others in the world um, if it's an issue like water what is best practice in protecting water resources, or as Georgine says, what's the best practice in engaging stakeholders so they can be heard, um, and crafting a standard which will never replace the importance of laws um, because everything that we host is a voluntary initiative. We are trying to create incentive for companies to be measured against something which is even stronger than laws in any country in the world. I, um, but it's a voluntary. And so it is never going to replace the importance of governments doing their job, but it can be used as a model to strengthen laws. There is not a country in the world which has laws sufficient to prevent significant harm where mining happens. That's true in Canada and Australia and the US and across Europe, as well as it is in Indonesia or Papua New Guinea or Southern Africa. Um, or Russia, um, where these materials for energy transition are coming from. Um, so it's intended to be something which uh, existing mines would be measured against, and they have to describe their performance um, on 26 chapters using auditors who are trained and accountable to IRMA to measure that performance and where the audits need to be publicly noticed before they happen. So the community knows an audit of the mine is happening. They understand how to use it, um, where the audit report coming at the end is detailed and is shared publicly. So again, uh, groups like Zimbabwe Environmental Law Association can pick up that report as they are with the Unki mine in Zimbabwe 
and look through where does the mine meet requirements, where does it not meet requirements, and begin to use it as a benchmark for asking for improvements at the site. Um, to come back to something Georgine said, in one, um, there are two chapters there that deal with this issue of consent. It's considered a critical requirement, which means for any achievement levels in IRMA. IRMA is not just pass fail, it's not a green check, you're responsible, it's scoring performance on 26 different chapters from how do you engage stakeholders to how does the mine protect its water or cultural heritage or air quality. Um, but one of those that is considered critical is do you have the consent of the community? Is beginning to create daylight around the fact that no, this company doesn't have consent. Um, why? What is the community asking for of this list of things that Georgine has ex um, explained there so that you can begin to hold accountability for that? Um, and um, by beginning to hold that accountability, you begin to create daylight for the customers of those minds to see that. We say that if you don't have community consent, those customers don't have security of supply, right? They, I mean, do they know that roads may be blockaded soon because the community is so frustrated they're not being heard about the fact that water isn't flowing anymore? Um, do they know that uh, there's so much conflict you may have a uh, violent altercation with security forces at the gate? It's dragging these issues out into the daylight more so that a greater range of the supply chain of mining and its customers understand the dynamic that's there and then creating pressure and support for those in the mining companies who could make things better to have that pressure. There's been so much market pressure to date to keep the prices as low as possible. So these materials just get out. You can sell them as cheaply as possible on the market. Can we create that pressure for uh, the social and environmental values around mines to be invested in so that if materials are going to be produced for green energy, you're holding them to an account that reflects a oh, climate stress world and communities increasingly under stress, drinking water increasingly under stress, flooding happening, which puts communities near mine waste also at risk. So it's ultimately Irma's standard is a tool. It's a tool that if you are a group like Georgine's group and you've got existing mines there, you can press for a mining company to be audited, look at performance and ask for change and improvement. You can have communities around these sites be heard. Um, do they feel they're being responded to by mining companies there? Um, and for governments and the NGOs and others that are encouraging them to improve policies as a model, for where should mining related laws in each country come up to to better protect the needs there and then spread that accountability from our car makers and jewelers all the way back up to the mine level to create value for environmental and social responsibility.